Well, I can't help myself. So you'll have to excuse this video if you're not interested in geeking out over some science. A while back, I analyzed multiple studies on the topic of creatine, but instead of focusing on muscle, I focused on the brain. Within that investigation, I uncovered something extremely intriguing about creatine's effects on our brains. As forewarning though, there's going to be a healthy discussion of mechanisms in this video. So if you want the pop science quick answers, I'll respectfully show you to the door. We're about to learn something that we've never heard before. There's this study that I ran across during my larger investigation that one, was something out of a science fiction film, and two, showed something unique about creatine that, as far as I know, no one has ever discussed about creatine before. First, the researchers recruited participants that were willing to have their oxygen supply cut off. They straight up choked them to death. Kidding, of course. At least partly, because they didn't choke them out MMA style, but they did have them wear gas masks that controlled the amount of oxygen that they were able to consume. So they effectively were oxygen deprived on purpose. We can even see that here. You see the SpO2 there on the left? That's their blood oxygen levels. You can see that they drop from around 100% saturation to around 80%, which is a substantial drop. What's also interesting is that their heart rate increased. That's a side note, but if you would like to guess, why do you think that their heart rate increased? There are a few plausible explanations, but post your hypothesis in the comments and I'll pin the comment that gets the right answer. Anyway, we're not here to discuss heart rate, we're here to discuss creatine. So one group of participants consumed creatine for several days leading up to the experiment, and the other group in a crossover design consumed a placebo, non-creatine drink that tasted identical. The two groups of data were then compared against one another across a variety of tests. But it's this one test in particular that got me really excited. As a matter of fact, I was visiting my grandparents when I read this study and I ended up talking my grandma's ear off about all the possibilities. I think she was more confused leaving this one-sided conversation than when she was sucked into it. <laughs> Don't worry though, I, I promise I'll do better with you. The experiment was a corticomotor excitability test, meaning the researchers are measuring the excitability or activation of neurons. Those are the nerve cells in your body that connect the brainstem to the muscle cells. The greater the excitement, the greater the response of the neurons. If we look at the placebo condition, we can see that as the researchers stimulate the nerves more, shown on the horizontal axis, the excitability increases, shown on the vertical axis. However, comparing the normal oxygen condition, meaning no oxygen deprivation versus hypoxia, which is oxygen deprivation, there's no big difference. However, when looking at the creatine group, there is a clear change. The hypoxic condition, sans oxygen, experienced increased excitability of the neurons. This is further evidenced when comparing the placebo versus the creatine groups here. The total difference is about five-fold increased excitability in the creatine condition when the body is low on oxygen. So you might be wondering, why does this matter? That's a good question. Well, for one, if you're ever in a horror movie and the killer is strangling you, you'll likely be able to think more sharply and fight back more vigorously, assuming that you've been supplementing creatine, of course. If you haven't, your last thoughts might be, why didn't I listen to Physionic? Well, don't feel too bad. You probably would have been screwed either way. But really, why does it matter? Well, greater excitability implies a better performing and more activity prone nervous system. This data comes from severe situations, but most of us don't go around depriving our brain of oxygen, so the direct application is low. However, this isn't the only study that I've found that shows creatine's neural benefits. I'll describe this in more detail shortly because I'd like for us to spend a bit more time on the mechanisms. As you likely know, as a member of Physionic, it isn't all about the data, it's about also understanding the mechanisms behind said data. So what is creatine doing to our nervous system? You may or may not already know this, depending on how awake you were during biology class, but your neurons, again, those are your nerve cells, send signals from one end of the cell to the other through the exchange of ions. 
To describe that more effectively, your neuron receives a signal from another neuron through what are known as dendrites. Those are the top section of the cell. If enough activating signals are sensed by the neuron, these signals are then aggregated, in a manner of speaking, at a location called the axon hillock, located here, just before this lengthy section called the axon. If the cell is activated to continue the signal, it sends the signal down the axon. Now, here is where creatine plays a role. When the signal is propagating from the top to the end of the axon, there's this exchange of ions in and out of the cell. That means that the axon is in a polarized state, meaning that certain ions like potassium are found readily inside of the axon, and certain other ions like sodium are found outside of the cell. When the signal reaches this section of the axon, gates or channels open to allow the exchange of ions. As the sodium levels are much higher, the influx of sodium into the cell leads the cell to become extremely positively charged because sodium is a positive ion. In doing so, that section of the cell has now depolarized and the signal moves on to the next section to repeat the process until it reaches the end of the axon where it eventually triggers the axon to release molecules that activate the next cell and follow the same pattern. This is how we communicate neural inputs and communicate neurally across our entire body. However, when the cell has depolarized, it has to readjust back to a polarized state, meaning it needs to kick out the sodium that came in and equilibrate a number of other things in preparation for the next activation. In doing so, it uses these massive pumps that literally kick out sodium and suck up potassium that's been displaced. Eventually, the cell enters back into its polarized state. This is called the resting membrane potential. Okay, Nick, how does any of this relate to creatine, though? Well, <laughs> if you need to react quickly to something on a cellular level, the faster that you can equilibrate back to the resting potential, the faster that you can activate again. Think of like a, a Formula One racing pit crew. The faster that you can work on the car, the faster it gets out of the gate. Unfortunately, those massive sodium potassium pumps require large amounts of cellular energy, known as ATP. So if you're stimulating the cell over and over, the stored cellular energy then drops from continuously having to repolarize. Now, since oxygen levels are also lower, that means that the mitochondrion, which is, yes, the powerhouse of the cell, can't generate energy as well because mitochondria within your cells require oxygen to generate ATP, cell energy. That's a discussion for another time though. The point being, your neurons require high concentrations of ATP, yet when they proverbially turn to the mitochondria within, the mitochondria are starved of the necessary oxygen to generate ATP. This is where creatine is thought to step in because higher creatine stores in the cell allows more creatine to be phosphorylated, which means that a tag is attached to the creatine molecule, which it then donates to spent energy molecules called ADP. ADP can then be turned back into ATP, independent of oxygen and the mitochondria, creating a reservoir of energy through creatine. So creatine helps preserve the energy state of the cell and allows more excitations, activations of the cell to occur per moment time, since it allows the sodium potassium pumps to remain active for longer. How incredible is that? Okay, but that still doesn't explain how applicable this information is, because who is going to be oxygen deprived other than people who are being strangled and people living in the mountains? Well, I've been using this study as an extreme example, but as I've discussed with the Physionic Insiders, which if you haven't joined yet, you're missing out because I go into far more detail there on really everything. And it comes with a bunch of perks, including all the premium content, a monthly podcast with applicable takeaways and more. Anyway, the point being, I discussed some of these intricacies there. And creatine does not only have a benefit in people starved of oxygen, but likely in most cognitively stressful situations. So we shouldn't be thinking about creatine from a muscle-centric perspective only, but as a nootropic as well. Indeed, I go into even more detail in my analysis of creatine on memory performance, which is actually where some of the critical nuances that you shouldn't miss are found. You can find that video linked for you right here.
and I'll speak to you over there. Bye.